what we're finding here is that it's really the folks who are still kind of tied to religion, really the unaffiliated folks are still kind of tied to religion who are less likely to show up and turn out. So this is interesting from a research perspective because it's counterintuitive and helps correct the literature. But this is also interesting um, from an applied perspective because it shows that, you know, the unaffiliated really will show up to vote, right? Once we motivate them, right? Once there is a sense that um, there's a coherent strategy for getting voter turnout. Thank you for coming to our event. We're the uh, Secular Society of MIT, and we host weekly meetups as well as various guest speaker events throughout the semester on the subject of atheism, humanism, and secularism. Our next event will be on Thursday, November 12th at 7 p.m., where in celebration of Sagan Day, MIT professor uh, Sarah Seeger will speak about the recent discovery of complex molecules in the atmosphere of Venus. Um, but now let me uh, introduce um, Evan Stewart. Uh, professor Evan Stewart is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and his research examines why people leave institutions and the political and cultural impacts of disaffiliation. Currently, this work focuses on the political impact of religiously unaffiliated Americans and the role of religion in public life, with articles published in Social Forces, Social Currents, and the Sociological Quarterly. He's also the managing editor of Sociological Images, the largest sociology blog in the United States. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, Evan Stewart. Well, thanks, Alex. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, hi, folks. Welcome. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad to have this opportunity to share my research with you in this um, wild semester we've been having. Um, I'm coming to you live from my apartment in Cambridge, just a few minutes north of campus, um, where I have been for the past goodness knows how long. Um, but today I'm here to talk about my research on religiously unaffiliated Americans, uh, research that I've been doing, stuff I've been engaged in, work my colleagues are doing. Um, this is timely work. I was really happy to have the invitation to come and, and talk with you about it um, because we are in the middle of an election year, because this is such a you know pivotal political moment for the United States. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to get the word out, um, especially for um, folks like your organization um, and others who are interested in what the sort of changing cultural dynamics of the American landscape have to do with um, changes in our political lives and potentially changes in the electorate. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. I've got some slides to accompany the talk. Um, go ahead and set that up. Um, all right, so my work is primarily on the politics of non-religious Americans right now. Um, I'm generally interested in why people lose trust in institutions, uh, why people decide to leave institutions. And religious disaffiliation is one specific case of this process um, that I focused on in my dissertation research as I was finishing my PhD. Um, and this has you know, a pretty strong bearing on our current political moment, um, both because we've seen some news and political attention to secular Americans um, through the founding of Humanists for Biden, the recent launching of Humanists for Biden, um, and through more increased media attention as we're sort of picking apart the electorate um, and doing the standard political horse race, looking at um, which demographic groups are prevalent in the electorate, which demographic groups are changing, um, and how those demographic groups might have an effect on the um, composition of the electorate, right? Whether or not people turn out to vote, who turns out to vote, and how that ultimately affects the way the race sh shakes out. Um, so a little bit of a roadmap for today on this timely issue. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit about what we know already, um, a little bit about the challenges of studying the political lives of secular Americans, um, what we're currently learning, some of what the cutting edge research says about this group, and then um, at the end, what you can do. And one thing I want to emphasize in this talk um, is that I'm going to talk a lot about the strong relationship between 
secular views um, and less religious views and um, progressive political views, um, the sort of relationship um, in which people who are unaffiliated with religion group, religious groups tend to be more progressive. Um, but those are not the only views among this group, right? Um, I'm not necessarily, you know, turning this talk into a um, democratic strategy session, right? If you are... Um, more centrist, more libertarian, more independent, even more conservative in your own political views, right? There's a lot of room to talk about that as well. Um, but because the general trend that we're going to talk about today is the association between secularism and political liberalism in the United States, that's going to get sort of the core focus um, for much of the talk. So um, to kick things off, a little bit about what we know about this group. Um, I should be clear here, I don't necessarily have to go through and define a lot of terms. I assume that if you're a member of a secular society, right, you, you, this is kind of um, well-worn knowledge for all of you. Um, but just in case, right, uh, my work focuses mainly on folks who claim no religious affiliation. So specifically what I mean by that is... Um, in my field, folks who on survey research um, will tick the box that says none of the above when you ask them what their religious preference is. So as opposed to Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or Hindu or Muslim or any other faith community, um, they will check none of the above. Um, and the most important thing to know about this group is that it's been growing. It's been growing fairly consistently and fairly rapidly since the 1990s, um, such that the unaffiliated or the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, or the people who claim no religion, um, are now about a quarter of the U.S. population. In the 2018 General Social Survey, uh, they were about 23% of the population. Um, other surveys from Pew put them a little higher, put them at closer to sort of 25, 26. Um, it sort of depends on how we phrase the question. There's a little bit of room for measurement error and fluctuation there. Um, but the anchor point, the sort of core estimate is that they're about a quarter of the US population and growing. Um, and this makes them collectively the largest religious minority group in the United States. So within this broad group of no religion folks, um, that's where we're really talking about um, many, many different subcategories, right? We're talking about folks who just call themselves nothing in particular. Um, we're talking about folks who call themselves spiritual but not religious. Oftentimes they will end up in this aggregated category as well. And then we're talking about folks who would call themselves agnostics, who are uncertain about the existence of God, and of course atheists um, who claim no belief in God. Um, so this is a large aggregate category, right? This quarter of the U.S. population has a lot of different people who fall into it. And a lot of my research is concerned with figuring out at what points is it appropriate to sort of subdivide and pay attention to these sort of nuanced uh, distinctions between folks who have different non-religious identities? And at what point is it better to aggregate this category, right? And to talk about, okay, when are we really talking about a quarter of the U.S. population and how that might change the electorate, right? So thinking a lot about the relationship between the particular and the general. So large and growing group. Um, and what we know about this group is that folks who claim no religious preference tend to be more progressive. Again, on the whole, on average, they tend to be more progressive in their political views. Um, there are, of course, important exceptions to this. Um, centrist and independent political views, libertarian political views are very prominent among some subgroups in this population. But on the whole, when we aggregate to that quarter of the U.S. population, those nuns, right, we tend to see that they are more progressive on a range of different political attitudes. And research kind of gives us two explanations for this. The first um, that many of you may be familiar with is that um, religious disaffiliation is a backlash to the political organizing of the religious right. Um, so organizations um, in the conservative movement worked very hard through the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s to forge a tight connection between conservative religious views and conservative political views. Um, and we really start to see the rise of no religious affiliation start in the 1990s with that sort of next generation of people coming up who see that tight connection and decide, well, if I'm progressive, right, religion probably isn't for me. Um, we also see evidence for a life course perspective on this. So we know that people tend to figure out their political views a little earlier in life. They tend to figure out their political views around late adolescence, early adulthood, um, around the time they're in late high school, early college. Um, and they tend to not settle on their religious views until later adulthood when they're getting married, 
having children, settling down, forming families. So we see that politics really sort of leads the decision um, in whether to become religiously affiliated or whether to remain religiously affiliated. Um, and so the result of that is we end up with a secular population in the United States, the no religion folks, who if we picked folks out randomly, it would be a fairly safe bet that they would at least be in part progressive. Right? And whether that's on cultural issues, whether that's on culture wars issues that we typically think about with the religion and politics um, discussion in this country, or whether that's on economic issues or other social issues, um, we tend to see these patterns. So this is well established in the research literature. But the result of that is to ask, okay, if there's a large and growing population of non-religious folks, if they tend to be progressive, isn't this going to be a boon for the Democratic Party? Right? Doesn't this just mean that Democrats are now going to sort of ride the wave of demographic change and we're going to see, you know, stronger Democrat, Democratic victories. The tricky part is that when we take survey research and we um, take large survey data sets and we interact um, political views and religious views, we start to get some interesting patterns here, right? So folks with no religious affiliation are about 40% of Democrats. About 40% of folks on surveys who tell us that they're Democrats um, also say that they have no religious affiliation. And that's a fairly sizable chunk of the Democratic Party. Um, and it's comparable in size to the proportion of independents and the proportion of folks who pick some other political party, um, really kind of holding steady at about that 35, 40% they are only about 16% of Republicans. So again, this looks like massive contribution to the Democratic base. Um, these numbers here that I'm showing you, thankfully um, this talk was aptly timed. Um, I was able to dive in to the latest release of the co um, Congressional Cooperative Election Study um, to bring you these numbers. So this is some of the latest and best estimates we have um, of how many unaffiliated people are self-identified Democrats, self-identified Republicans, et cetera. Um, but the important thing that I want to emphasize here and the important thing for my work and for understanding this group is that religiously unaffiliated people are also half of the folks who tell us they're not sure what their political party is. Now, if you pay attention to politics, um, or even if you try not to pay attention to politics, it might be really surprising that there are folks who will tell us on a survey that they're not sure who their political party is, right? And in conditions of political polarization, in conditions where um, we're seeing increased political conflict and tension in the United States, it seems kind of strange that there would be people who wouldn't choose a side or wouldn't be sure about which side they fell on. Um, but this is really important, right? It shows that there's something else going on among religiously unaffiliated people that isn't just about partisanship, right? That isn't just explained by their progressive political views. Because if that were the case, we would expect far, far more amongst the Democratic Party and far fewer to be in this not sure camp. So this is sort of the lay of the land that we start with. These are sort of well-known facts in the research literature. Um, and this gets me into the challenge, right? Why it's difficult to study the non-religious as a large aggregate group. One of the challenges I've really found in my own work and in reading the work of my colleagues is that there are many, many different reasons people leave religious groups. I'm sure each person in the audience, um, if you are personally religiously unaffiliated, you probably have your own story about how you got to be that way. Um, and in the course of my research, um, I've traced many different explanations. The literature has traced many different explanations, but they basically amount to two sort of different story genres that we can tell, two sort of different um, meta stories, if you will. Um, I call them the breaking up story versus the drifting away story. Right? The breaking up story is fundamentally about people who make the conscious choice to leave a religious group or leave a religious tradition or leave the religion that their family belongs to. Um, so these are folks who deliberately considered their belief systems, who deliberately considered uh, their membership in different groups and decided, mm, it's not for me. The drifters, on the other hand, didn't necessarily ever make a conscious choice to leave religion. And in fact, it's possible for many drifters that they never even started with a strong religious affiliation in the first place. Um, so we know that folks who break up with religious groups, who tend to leave religious groups, um, they usually make a conscious choice to leave. Um, they usually exhibit distinct patterns in role exit, 
um, distinct preparations to leave a religious group. Um, oftentimes there's the political backlash aspect. Um, and so what we see is these folks tend to establish coherent partisan identities. They tend to know where they stand on the big issues in life. And that's the, whether that's the big issues about religion or the big issues about politics, they tend to have themselves figured out in that way. On the other hand, drifters, not so much. They tend to have more secular family and peer groups, right? It's much more common in the United States nowadays for folks to grow up in secular households, and it's much more common for folks to have more secular friends. So the result of this is that it's more normal to just not interface with religion at all, right? Um, we see changes in work and social groups. Um, we see folks more engaged with precarious work. If anyone works in the service industry um, or the retail industry, you know with just-in-time scheduling, you're not necessarily sure what weekends you're going to be working or what shifts you're going to be working. Um, and so what we end up seeing is a distinct group of people who even if they wanted to be involved in a religious community, they might not necessarily be able to, right? They might have to work on the conventional Sunday mornings. Or in the before times when we could go out, um, these are folks who just enjoyed brunch, right? They didn't necessarily give up church, they just liked brunch instead, right? So among this group, we would expect more diffuse political views, right? They haven't necessarily built an identity, they haven't necessarily built an ideology around not being religious, they just aren't religious, they've drifted away. And so the result is one of these groups makes partisans, right? The other group doesn't necessarily make partisans, but it's way bigger, right? The drifters are much larger in aggregate in survey research than the breakers. And this has implications for the way we study um, religiously unaffiliated people and the way we can think about which religiously unaffiliated people will ultimately end up in the electorate. So here's what we're learning about that, right? When we start to take into account the difference between the breakers and the drifters, right? We start to get a better picture of how political engagement works among non-religious folks. So we're learning things about non-religious identities. Um, you can imagine a sort of two by two typology or sort of a way to sort folks um, based on their engagement with religion right, sort of highs and lows, um, whether or not folks practice any particular religion, um, they could practice a lot or they could practice a little bit, and whether or not folks think religious import, religion is important to them, right, whether they think it's very, very important and they sort of live it every day and it's central to their lives or, you know, it's not important at all. In theory, right, we would expect the nuns to be in this lower quadrant, right, we'd expect folks um, to say religion's not super important in my life or I don't necessarily believe in it. And of course I don't practice at all because of that, right? We expect people to be very coordinated in their religious practices, beliefs, identities, right? We expect people to be aligned. And so we wouldn't necessarily expect to see a lot of non-religious people, certainly in this high and high quadrant and not necessarily in these mixed quadrants, right? There could be someone who goes to church a lot, but, you know, they don't think religion is very important, or there could be someone who thinks religion is really important, but they never really found a faith community to belong to, and so they're not, you know, very often practicing. We often expect this kind of consistency, where, where the nuns should be sort of neatly here, and we can infer a lot about what they think about religion, and then implicitly what they think about politics, just from their identity, right? Just the fact that they checked the nun box. But the challenging thing that we run into is we don't actually see that when we look at the data. All right, so this is an example from the Cooperative Congressional Election Study. Um, and the idea here is taking folks um, self-reports of how important religion is to them and how often they attend religious services, as an example, and then whether or not they identify as some kind of religiously affiliated or some kind of unaffiliated. And one of the most important things to observe here is that these blue dots, these unaffiliated folks, are certainly, you know, concentrated in this lower quadrant the way we would expect, but they also spill over a lot. There are a lot of folks who claim no religious identity who still think religion is very important to them, right? There are a lot of folks who claim no religious identity um, who still attend frequently, right? And in my actual analysis of this group, we find that, you know, this is not just a statistical anomaly, right? This is not just measurement error. Um, this is not just folks who sort of fall in the tail ends of the normal distribution, right? These are folks who have 
inconsistent religious beliefs and identities, which we're finding more and more is the truth of how people live both their religious identities and their non-religious identities, right? More people have a mix of these. And this is really important for us to consider. In work in progress that I'm doing using um, logic of machine learning to sort of sort out folks' religious identities and see if we can predict folks' religious identities, I find that we're most often misclassifying non-religious people because we haven't really worked through systemically how to account for these differences in the importance of religion and how often they're practicing religion and these kind of issues. And this has really important implications for most of the stuff you hear in the news about non-religious communities. The most important thing is that we have good evidence now that folks who are from historically marginalized communities, whether that's women, whether that's folks of color, or folks in other um, minority groups, minority and minoritized groups, we know that they're le less likely than other folks to sort of check that none box or check that nothing in particular box. Even if for them, right, they're still effectively secular, even if religion is not super important to them, even if they're not practicing often, we know that we have biased measures of non-religious identification. And what that means is that there's good evidence that the nuns, the non-religious folks, are way more diverse than um, the news has been reporting and than previous research has been reporting. We know they're probably more diverse in terms of race and ethnicity. We know they're probably more diverse in terms of gender and sexuality. And that diversity really gets hidden in the current measurement approaches we have for surveying this group. And so um, I want to highlight this book, Religion is Raced, um, that has some excellent work in it um, from noted secular activist Sakivu Hutchinson, um, and also some uh, colleagues of mine who do um, demographic research, um, showing new evidence for this, right? So when we talk about um, the politics of non-religious Americans, right, we oftentimes ignore examples like folks who are engaged in other activist communities, right? We, engage, we ignore folks on the left, maybe folks who are active in the Black Lives Matter movement, or maybe folks who are active um, in other democratic socialist movements, for example, because they're effectively secular, but they won't necessarily tell us that on surveys. That's not the most important identity to them. So we really are working to refine our measures of this group because we don't necessarily have a good sense of the broadest range of political identities and ideologies that are present among the non-religious. And we're working to improve those measures. We're also learning new things about political engagement. Um, and one of the things I try to do a lot in my work is engage this sort of shared cultural myth we have that nuns aren't joiners. Um, there are many, many versions of this quote attributed to many different celebrities, this idea of I'm not a joiner, right? I am skeptical of groups and organizations. Um, there's this sort of assumption that if folks leave religious groups or never start in religious groups, they're also less likely to be engaged in other kinds of groups, right? They're less likely to be civically engaged. They're less likely to volunteer. Um, they're less likely to be politically engaged. They're less likely to vote. Um, there's been a lot of research that sort of argues that civic engagement and being active, whether it's in politics or in your communities, is cumulative, right? So if you're opting out of one type of organization, you're opting out of others. If you're less religious, you're also less voluntary or less of a joiner. I think personally, in my reading of the evidence, this is largely a myth. And this is largely due to problems in our assumptions and our analysis that we've been doing so far. The biggest example of this, um, one of the big examples of this is some colleagues of mine, uh, Penny Angel and Jackie Frost, showed in a paper that um, actually non-religious folks are sort of equally likely to volunteer in their communities. Once we incorporate multiple measures of different kinds of volunteering, and once we account for differences inside the nuns, so differences between the nothings in particulars and the atheists and the agnostics, we start to see that a sizable portion of non-religious people actually volunteer at comparable rates to their religiously affiliated counterparts, right? Uh, most of the difference is explained by other demographic factors, their age, their gender, their education level. Um, in my own work, I look primarily at voting behavior 
Um, so I look at validated voter turnout. Um, so surveys that have been collected and then matched to known voter records. So we have both sort of self-reported voter turnout, whether or not people say they voted, and actual records of whether or not they voted, which there are discrepancies and there are differences. Um, we do see that folks tend to misreport whether or not they voted on surveys. Um, but in my analysis of this data, what I find is that um, previous research that had argued that the non-religious don't turn out to vote, it's overstated. First of all, most of the gap between uh, religious and non-religious folks is again explained by other demographic factors, age, education, income. Um, very little of the turnout gap has to do with um, actual religion or non-religion. The other interesting thing I find is that these lines slope in different directions. Um, and the short version of this graphic here is that among religiously affiliated folks, folks who do tell us they have a religious tradition, going to church less often is associated with lower odds of turning out to vote in this validated vote data. So folks who attend less often, slightly less likely to vote, right? There's a more dramatic effect among the unaffiliated, right? Among folks who don't have a religious affiliation, not going to church, right? Less frequent religious practice associates much more strongly with higher odds of turning out to vote. It runs in the opposite direction. So that the folks who are not turning out to vote among the unaffiliated happen to be the unaffiliated who tell us they're going to church a lot. Now, who the heck are the unaffiliated who are telling us they're going to church a lot? They're typically people who are going with their families. They're typically people who don't necessarily have a strong sense of what their religion means to them. And so we would expect them to behave like unmotivated partisans, like the majority of Americans, like many Americans, who aren't really sure what they think about politics and don't necessarily have settled views and settled patterns of behavior. Um, and what we're finding here is that it's really the folks who are still kind of tied to religion, really the unaffiliated folks who are still kind of tied to religion who are less likely to show up and turn out. So this is interesting from a research perspective because it's counterintuitive and helps correct the literature. But this is also interesting um, from an applied perspective because it shows that, you know, the unaffiliated really will show up to vote, right? Once we motivate them, right? Once there is a sense that um, there's a coherent strategy for getting voter turnout right, um, once there's a good strategy for getting folks um, registered to vote, um, there is real potential here, right? The gap between the affiliated and the unaffiliated can be closed. And then finally, um, things we're learning about political views among the nuns. Um, so this is some other work I've done in public opinion uh, looking at how non-religious people think about a variety of issues. Um, and in this work, I really focus on two different kinds of measures for not being religious. Um, I focus on measures of public non-religion. So these are uh, disagreements with statements about religion in the public sphere, right? So this is um, survey questions asking folks whether they think political leaders should have strong religious beliefs, whether they think religion should factor into public policy, um, whether being religious is part of being a good citizen. And if people disagree with those, then they score higher on this sort of public non-religion scale. Um, we also measure their personal non-religion. So whether or not they believe in God, whether or not they attend services, whether or not they you know, think religion is very important. Um, and so we can measure sort of the personal and the public dimensions. And here, we're getting more information about what actually it is about non-religion that might shape people's political views, right? Or what it is about that backlash, right? That might shape people's non-religious views. And what we find is it's not about personal non-religion, not going to church, not believing in God, not thinking religion is important to you, doesn't really have the strongest relationship with how folks are thinking about politics. What does across a wide range of measures is their public non-religion views. So a much better predictor of their partisanship is whether or not folks think religion belongs in the public sphere. And if they're strongly opposed to religion in the public sphere, and religion as a source of public authority, uh, they're much more likely to express all kinds of other progressive attitudes, 
progressive attitudes on addressing racial inequality, progressive attitudes on race and inclusion and citizenship, progressive attitudes on immigration, Democrat party ID, progressive views on the social safety net and economic inequality, um, and all kinds of other issues. What we're finding is what previous research didn't do was it didn't control for these public views, right? It was only controlling about, only controlling for religious piety, these sort of personal measures of how engaged someone is in religion. And so it's missing a major explanatory factor and just sort of assuming that folks who are personally religious or personally non-religious, that's what shapes their political views. This also helps us explain the sort of paradox on the right, right? Many folks have pointed out how um, conservative, oftentimes evangelical populations continue to support Republican candidates who don't necessarily share their religious beliefs. Folks point this out as paradoxical, right? Our results suggest it's not paradoxical, right? Belief is not the most important thing. What matters is that these groups tend to really favor religious authority in the public sphere. Right? And that's what drives their partisanship. So based on these um, results we have, right, we have new information about non-religious folks. Um, some of you may be politically involved. Some of you may want to be politically involved, or you may want to be more politically involved. Um, and so I wanted to close this talk with some sort of lessons, some practical lessons for what um, folks who are secular or non-religious can do um, if they want to sort of bolster political gains among this group or um, want to be just generally more involved in their communities. And it really boils down to one big point um, that I really want to emphasize here um, with clap emojis, right? Be in coalition. It is really important, I think, for folks who are not religious to think about being in coalition with other social groups. Um, and this is mainly because that large group that's about a quarter of the US population that everybody talks about, atheists and agnostics only make up a small portion of it, right? They make up less than half. And so it's really important for secular groups and organizations, whatever their goals may be, right? Whether they're political or whether they're community minded, right? To think about forging ties with other organizations to think about forging ties with other social groups. A good example here is the sort of hypothetical case of democratic politics. If you're secular and you happen to be a Democrat and you're interested in supporting democratic candidates, what we see here is that the coalition of secular voters and the coalition of progressive religious voters alone in previous elections um, are not larger than the religious right. Right, conservative and religious voters in terms of self-reports made up about 24% of the electorate in 2016. But together, secular and religious progressive voters will outnumber them by these theories, right? These are from analysis from my colleagues, Joe Baker and Gerardo Mardi, um, recently published in Sociology of Religion. Um, and so it's really important, I think, um, for any group that's interested in more having more sort of effective political mobilization to really think about being in coalition. Um, and I'll just sort of close with an illustration of this um, from my uh, dissertation research and that that's being refined here. Um, I went through and I tracked network relationships between groups that claim to represent non-religious coalitions and secular coalitions in the public sphere. Um, so this is from 2006, and we really see sort of three clusters of organizations, right? We see a cluster around the Secular Coalition for America, a cluster around American atheists, and a cluster around Americans United for the separation of church and state. Now, if you're familiar with these organizations, you might know that Americans United for the Separation of Church and State is a much older organization and a much larger organization that works with a wide range of progressive causes. They spend a lot of money on lobbying um, and policy influence, and here they're very sort of isolated from the network. And what we've seen here over the past 10 years, over the past decade or so, is that while the network of secular organizations has really coalesced and come together and started to work together as a team, the secular coalition is right here at the center of it. Americans United is really at the periphery. Right? And the interesting thing about this is that if we compare money spent on lobbying, if we compare issue advocacy, if we compare political strategies, right? The group that is better at getting the goods for political representation for secular folks 
is Americans United, right? But they're also the group that's on the periphery of the organizations that claim to represent secular folks, right? So it's food for thought for folks who are interested in the organizational dimensions of these groups, especially for secular community groups like the um, Secular Students Association. I believe they're in here. Yeah, the SSA right here. You can see them right here. Um, and other groups, right? If you're interested in doing community organizing, if you're interested in doing community work, I think it's worth folks' time to consider interfaith work, to consider interdisciplinary work, to consider working with many different community organizations in coalitions. You folks might already be doing that, right? Um, other organizations I know are already doing that. Um, and if anything, that's only going to sort of augment the influence that um, secular individuals and secular organizations have in the public sphere um, today. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate the invite to come and speak to you. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, my email and my Twitter are here if you're interested. Um, otherwise, uh, looking forward to the Q&A with everybody. Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, yeah, let's let's open it up to questions. Uh, you we'll can use uh, your or... you can use the reaction reactions to applaud if you if you like. <laughs> um, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I th just just to make sure we don't uh, over talk like talk over anything. Also, oh, first of all, we're we're taking we're gonna take some questions for a while, and then after that, we'll um we we'll, like after. After the event end time, we'll keep the event open in case people want to hang around and discuss further afterwards. Everyone, anyone is welcome to stay um, after we officially end the event and stop recording. Um, so yeah, this. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, they can they can just um, raise a hand or message and or message me or message like just put your name in the in the group chat, and uh, I'll un. Yeah. Or whatever. So on, do you mind if I go ahead and kick off with uh, Bonnie's question that came in the chat? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, so while I was talking, um, Bonnie posted a great question in the chat, really is talking about Christian nationalism, right? Um, I really appreciate this question, Bonnie. Um, the short version is yes. The long version is that um, I take a slightly different tack on it, um, mainly just to argue um, and I think Christian nationalism is one very specific, one very historically and socially specific manifestation of public religion more broadly, right? So that there are other ways of doing public religion. It could be Christian nationalism, could be um, a new sort of social gospel movement for religious progressivism, right? There are other frameworks that folks could use, but definitely Christian nationalism is, is linked up here. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I guess just an interesting note is that um, Greg Epstein, who is the MIT uh, humanist chaplain, is actually the um, I think the chairman of the Humanists for Biden campaign. Uh, Simon asks, I believe you said that people in marginalized communities are less likely to describe themselves as unaffiliated. Why is this? Yes, that is a great question. Um, so this is sort of cutting edge of the research. We don't necessarily have a super well-established explanation, but I can definitely give you the working theory based on the evidence we have. So what we see is um, when we test different kinds of identification options in survey research. So sometimes it's just affiliated versus unaffiliated. Sometimes we, find, we test um, nothing in particular versus atheist or agnostic, right? Um, what we find is that typically white people are more likely to call themselves unaffiliated and white people are more likely to call themselves atheists as opposed to nothing in particular or atheists as opposed to spiritual, but not religious. Yeah. Um, the working theory. So for a long time, the literature had what I think is a very bad explanation for this. Their bad explanation, in my opinion, was that, oh, you know, women and people from other marginalized communities are more risk averse and they're more likely to believe in religion because of Pascal's wager and, you know, these sorts of, I, I don't buy that explanation. Where I come in and the work I've done has been focused on um, anti-atheist bias and the sort of stigma that folks in non-religious groups face. Um, and so I take a social risk um, explanation um, for this. So basically what I, what I would argue and what 
I think the literature supports, it is not that people from um, marginalized communities are more risk averse. It's that folks from marginalized communities already deal with their own stuff because they're in marginalized communities. And so they're more likely to take a more quote unquote palatable or a less stigmatized identity option on the survey, right? Um, and so, you know, sort of what we see, what the implication of that is, is that we end up thinking that unaffiliated folks or that non-religious folks are um, wider because we miss sort of folks of color, um, for example, who say like, well, you know, religion's just not that important to me, but I guess I'm, you know, Christian or whatever I was raised in, right? I'm more interested in being involved in these communities or I'm more, you know, it's more important to me to be this identity or to be, you know, LGBTQIA plus or something else, right? Um, so that's why I think we're seeing these issues in how we measure secular communities. Yeah, great question. Uh, so Rafi asks, is there any control for leaving from different religions? Do all secular folks, regardless of religious upbringing, all behave cohesively? Or will two identical people, each with a different religious past, say evangelical versus Jewish, behave the same? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, there is a control for leaving from different religions. Um, there is a sort of exit group. Um, we do know that kind of the backlash theory holds from people. So when people change religions, so when people convert, they tend to convert to a religion that's similar to the one that they came from. So typically what we see is that the, um, the majority of folks who fall into the unaffiliated category are folks who were in pretty kind of moderate or middling religious groups to begin with, if they convert out. And the folks who leave like really strict or really intense religious experiences tend to sort of backlash more, more strongly. Right. And they tend to go, you know, full atheist or, or, or full on, um, so in terms of will two identical people, each with a religious past, um, behave the same, I would say no. I think it definitely can have a lot to do with uh, where you came from. Um, I would imagine that, for example, someone who grew up in a very orthodox evangelical community or a very strict evangelical community, I would wager that if they get out, they sort of swing out more extremely um, and go towards atheism. If we're saying like a more kind of moderate Jewish household, um, you know, a not very Orthodox Jewish household, I would, you know, I would guess that they probably just sort of drift into not religious. But of course, everyone's story is different. Um, and this is, you know, not really a deterministic thing over anyone's particular story. But I, you know, the question is really important because that context definitely does matter. We know that social context really matters for how people um, sort of shake out their non-religious identities later in life. Um, Eric asks, what is importance of religion in the Cartesian graph you showed when dissecting the nuns? How is that measured? Also, can you talk about this group more? What reasons do they give when they say religion is important? That's great. So importance of religion, um, it's a pretty straightforward question. We ask how important is your religion to you? Usually it's a, a Likert or Likert type scale of, you know, a four is very, very important. A three is important. A two is, you know, not so important. And a one is not important at all. Um, other surveys do like a scale of one to 10. Um, if any of you are uh, psychologists or social psychologists, right, this measure, we're really tapping religious salience, folks um, sort of top of mind, um, centralized thinking about um, religion. And we find that it's a much better predictor for a lot of things than your conventional measures of like church attendance um, or belief in God, actually, um, because it's really measuring whether religion is top of mind. Um, it's, it's more closely correlated with um, other types of attitudes, other types of behaviors. Um, it's much more kind of situationally volatile, like in cell phone studies, it's a better measure of like whether someone is religious at any given time. Um, so that's why I included it. Um, it's also available in the data, which is great. Um, so if we think about someone who is um, a nun but thinks religion is important, right? They're the really interesting group. We're working on unpacking it. Um, I think that they're folks who are in these kind of non-denominational communities, um, the type of folks who end up in a storefront church or who end up in a community that's really not about denominations, man. We're just about Jesus, right? Um, folks who, for whom religion actually can be very important, these sort of new religious movements that are really challenging established institutional churches. Um, so their religion is very important. But if you ask them what religion they are, they, they will mess with the measure and they will tell us, oh, I don't have a religion, right? It's about faith for me. 
right? Or it's, it's about Jesus for me. Um, we know those people exist. The literature has been bad at studying them um, thus far. So um, there's more work to do there, but that's a great question. Um, David, do measures of public religion also correlate with political views, partisan identity among people who are religiously affiliated? Yes. Yes, is the short version. Um, they're strongly correlated. And in fact, oftentimes what we can do is um, when we control for public religion, which a lot of work hasn't done because we don't have it on a lot of surveys, when we control for public religion, the tight relationship between personal religion and these political views oftentimes weakens or disappears. Right? So what's left over when you do control for public religion are progressive religious folks, right? Folks who do have a strong faith, who do think religion is important, but they're also Democrats or they're also you know, social Democrats even. Um, and they, so they sort of knock out that strong correlation between uh, personal piety and political views. Sorry, uh, just, to, just to follow up on that. Um, yeah. What, what measures, uh, what like data sets do you have available besides the congressional, the cooperative congressional election study mm -hmm. that you mentioned? Yeah. Um, so the, I use uh, many different data sets in my work. I do a lot of secondary data analysis. So, um, Cooperative Congressional Election Study, the General Social Survey, the American National Election Study. These are three main data sets that I use for descriptive statistics and I use for sort of population estimates. Um, the public religion results come from two surveys that I fielded um, for my dissertation research. One was the uh, Boundaries in the American Mosaic Study, which is the nationally representative just one-shot survey in 2014. Um, done at the University of Minnesota American Mosaic Project. And then the other one, um, you probably saw BAM and CSPP, those abbreviations, um, the, that was the BAM. And the CSPP was a 2016 um, national election study that was run by the University of Minnesota Center for the Study of Political Psychology. So basically, um, one of my big scholarly agenda things is establishing these measures of public religion. So we know they're there, we know the effects replicate in two data sets working on more. You know, I, I just put in grant funding to try and run another survey with them. So, you know, we're slowly trying to push getting people to add them. Um, but that's a great question. Um, so we got that. Uh, Alex asks, do you think that breakers and drifters and their different average militancy affect whether, which people become public atheist figures? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I think... So I would say you can ask a follow-up question after my answer because I want to I want to make sure I get at this answer, but I'm, I'm not sure my initial one will be satisfying. But I think most public atheist figures, and here I'm going to define that pretty narrowly as your Dawkins, your Sam Harris, your Chris Hitchens, and your more kind of contemporary figures that are in that sort of new atheism vein. I think they draw almost all of their public image, public support from breakers, or at least if they're not people who broke, it's people who developed a breaker-like profile of very strong, ardent, committed atheism, deliberately considered, right? And turned into not just a worldview, but an identity in some sense, right? Um, drifters don't necessarily do the same thing, right? A drifter might be someone who just likes going to brunch or a drifter might be someone who gets a tarot reading from time to time or a drifter might be someone who, you know, tried out Buddhism, didn't really like it, isn't really sure what they want, right? I don't think they care about sort of public atheist figures. And so it's, it's interesting because when we think about like the difference between the quarter of Americans who have no affiliation and the four to 6% of Americans who are atheists, those are very different groups. And so I think they have very different political potential and I think they have really different representation. And part of you know, why I love giving talks like this is to sort of ask secular groups to consider, okay, who is your representation, right? Who is your representation? Who do you want representing you? And who would you like to be in coalition with to potentially advance your own interests, right? Um, does that answer your question, Alex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, no, that was exactly what I was asking. Because okay. I have kind of noticed that, like, a lot of the very, like, the people with blogs or, like, the people with, like, podcasts are often those who have left. And I was wondering if there was any kind of representation of the, like, the drifters in public figures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. 
And, and the breakers and drifters, um, and these are genres, right? These are not necessarily deterministic stories of any one person's experience, but there, you know, there's a lot of similarities across. Um, let's see, uh, Tetiana asks, um, I'm not sure I understand what counts as religiously affiliated. Great question. Um, for example, my mother believes there's some higher force which participate in the creation of the world, will punish bad acts and reward for good ones that can help you in a hard life situation if you pray for help. Um, she also thinks that the Bible and church are created by humans and may be far from what God actually wants or is, but baptizes children anyway because it's harmless. Um, she is definitely religious, uh, but is she religiously affiliated? I'm so glad, Tatiana, you asked this question. Um, so your mother I will say is normal. Sociologically speaking, your mother is normal. And I know that sounds wacky, um, but all the best work we have on religion right now suggests that it is normal for people to be inconsistent and incoherent and borderline incoherent in their religious beliefs. The people who are really coordinated, the people who believe strongly, live that belief through practice, are very clear about, you know, they're joining and they're active members of their faith community. They're weird, right? They're statistically weird. They're not, you know, they're probably perfectly fine people, but they're, you know, they're weird in a researcher sense, right? Um, and this is, I think, something that uh, secular groups often miss about religious people, right? I'm secular myself. We're very quick to point out religious hypocrisy. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Religious hypocrisy is normal, right? No one is, like, it doesn't negate folks' religious positions because it, inconsistency is the order of the day, right? Because humans are inconsistent about their belief systems. Humans are inconsistent about their cognitive systems. We all are. And so, um, you know, so all that is to say, I would count um, your mother as religiously affiliated if when I gave that sort of list of options like Protestant, Catholic, um, Hindu, Buddhist, like if she picked an option that she felt best described her and that option was not unaffiliated, for now I would put her in the affiliated camp. But one of the things we're getting better at is using more holistic composite measures. So it's not about the categorical, like are you in or are you out or the differences in kind, but it's more about differences in magnitude, right? How strongly do these things motivate you, right? How salient, how important um, are these religious considerations in your life? And, and so thinking about it more as a sliding scale and less of a like, she's in this box or she's not in this box. Um, it's a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. The problem is also that like there are cultural differences. Like I'm not sure whether she will pick box Christian or not, but like she's Ukrainian and there are like very few Catholics or like Hindus or Buddhists or whatever in that region. Mm -hmm. So like most people use like the word Christian and like religious mm -hmm. and interchangeably. So like I'm not sure that just claiming being Christian, but like not actually having Christian beliefs because like most Christians wouldn't agree with my mother's beliefs at all. Uh, whole like strictly christians mm -hmm. exactly exactly it's tricky and so you know one of the things we try to do is we try to validate these categorical approaches some of my work is is trying to be a little more skeptical about saying you know when people say they are a particular thing right do we take them at face value or do we try to infer where they might be based on other measures of their religious engagement um I think doing, doing the first part, like taking people at their word has a lot of use scientifically and also not taking them at their word all the time also has use scientifically. Um, Eric, uh, why are the vast majority of politicians claiming a religion, but it's very rare for a politician to say that they are none or agnostic or atheists? Is it the case that politicians receive an advantage for claiming a religion, but receive no advantage or even disadvantage for rejecting religion? If that's the case, why is this the case? Yes. So we do have some uh, religiously unaffiliated um, pub officials in public life. Um, one notable one is uh, Kirsten Sinema, um, representative from Arizona, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and a couple others, too. Uh, there, there has been a Congressional Free Thought Caucus founded. Um, the way I think about it is um, it's a mixture of factors. I think your question's pretty much got it spot on. One is historical and contemporary anti-atheist stigma in the United States, which is real. It's persistent. I've measured it and published on it. It's, it's there. Um, but I think another factor is that because of all the work that the religious right did, um, 
right now appealing to religious groups is the sort of default strategy, right? Because religious groups were able to mobilize people, religious groups were able to get folks out to vote um, fairly well. Um, and also religious organizations were good at getting people into behind the scenes positions where they weren't necessarily doing electoral politics, they were doing policy work. Right? They were establishing faith-based initiatives and charitable organizations and, you know, shared institutional governance, right? That has very little to do with electoral politics. So all that combines to a politician who does the math and, and looks at their options that it's just, well, you go to the prayer breakfast and you shake hands with these people and you visit these churches and that's kind of it. Now, I think that can change, but I, I think it, like, in order for that to change, politicians' incentives have to change. And for politicians' incentives to change, they have to be able to see that there's a reason to do that. And one of the things is, is that because so many secular folks are progressive, because we do have that tight relationship, well, the voter turnout's happening anyway. And um, yeah, so that's that, you know, it's, it's sort of continue as business as usual. Now, one thing that helps is the founding of organizations like Humanists for Biden, right? If that organization is successful, what that's going to do is that's going to show Democrats that, hey, if you want to mobilize the Democratic base, you have to consider the secular folks, right? Um, but Humanists for Biden has to deliver the goods. It's untested. We don't know, right? We know that some religious groups can deliver the goods. We don't know that secular groups can deliver the goods yet. Um, I think they can. But we have to see. So politicians will change when their incentives change. Um, I think it is improving. I think it's much more normal to be religiously unaffiliated, and a lot more politicians are. Um, but I think the open atheism is still a little ways off. It, it can happen, but there's going to have to be pretty robust cultural change, I think, um, to accompany that. Um, so that's Eric's question. David's question. Uh, often there is much made of the increased rates of religious nuns among younger people. Should we expect this number to decrease as the return to religious affiliation? I'm going to do this quick uh, version. Um, yes, we do typically experience a sort of ebb and flow, right? The tide goes out when people are young adults and it comes back in for religion when they become parents, right? Um, there's preliminary evidence that the tide is not coming back in the same way for the youngest group of young parents. Um, so stay tuned. Um, we, we do know that a lot of the change, a lot of the growth in secularization, a lot of the decline in religion is what we call cohort change. So each generation is subsequently less religious than the last. Um, so we, so you're right that there is that kind of you know, you get less religious all through college and then you start a family and maybe you come back, but that same pattern is now happening with a lower intercept and a lower intercept each successive generation. Um, yes, Congressman Jamie Raskin is another good example. Um, and then Rafi, uh, as you alluded to, the religious right is the product of decades of solicitation by the Republican Party. Yep, yep. Can this model be copied to address the fact that 50% of not sures are not affiliated? What is their rallying cry? Um, I think the model can be copied, but I don't think we necessarily need a rallying cry. I think the best thing, if you're interested in copying the religious right model in your own organizations, whatever they may be, I think the big dirty secret is that the religious right did kind of get voters out, but not as much as you'd think. They got enough voters out to get folks into power and get cabinet positions. They got enough voters out to get folks in power and fund faith-based initiatives to be the default when government wants to do a social safety net program, right? Um, if you want to copy their model, I would say look at the Tea Party. I would say look at the Federalist Society, the organization that um, organizes conservative justices in law schools. I would look at the organizations that are willing to show up and do the boring stuff so they become the default people who get called when the boring stuff needs to be done and they accumulate political power that way. Um, that doesn't need a rallying cry. I mean, the rallying cry is great. I do think there is also a potential for a rallying cry on the secular left. My hunch, this is not informed by the research, this is a hunch, right? Pure 100% hunch, so take it with a grain of salt. My hunch is that the rallying cry is 
we need better science policy, period. COVID, climate change, like we need experts again. And I think that is a rallying cry for secular people. I think it's a rallying cry for public non-religion because it says we need scientific authority in the public sphere to deal with our most pressing social problems. And I think it's a point of commonality between the secular left and the religious left. Um, because it really doesn't matter what you believe personally or theologically, right? You can work in coalition because you both want to deal with the big existential threats that are, you know, impending upon us, you know. Um, that I think is a much easier rallying cry than atheists stand up or nothing in particulars come out, right? It's saying, you know, are you fed up? Would you like experts in charge? Well, here's how we think about expertise. Right. Yeah, any other questions? All right, uh, any, any last call? <laughs> Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, then um, uh, I'm just posting the links again to our events. So we have our event calendar. You can find our main list of events, the link to the upcoming second day event. That's on the November, November the 12th. Um, for all those who are here who are from, from university communities, we're having also an event on, um, on the uh, 27th of um, of this month, actually, just in just a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, that's posting that link over here as well. Uh, that's our InterVarsity meetup um, for people from different university communities to meet up and discuss the secular organizing as well as to enjoy a little social. Uh, I've also posted Dr. Dr. Stewart's website. That's uh, www.evan-stewart.com. Um, so I hope to see you at our events. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Stewart. Oh yeah, uh, Twitter, um, that's him as well. <laughs> Love academic Twitter, it's great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank, thank you, that was a very fascinating talk. I, I, I learned a lot uh, and I hope to see you around um, and once, the, once the coronavirus especially is over. We would have loved, to, we were actually supposed to have uh, Dr. Stewart in, in April, but unfortunately this, this thing hit and it would have been wonderful to have a, a nice live event, but you know, sadly, um, but still it was, uh, it was, it was, went, went about as well, I think, as a online event could go. So thank you everyone. And uh, yeah, uh, we're going to follow that. Just, I'm going to use my reaction to uh, make an applause thing, I guess. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you all coming out and I'm happy to stick around for a couple minutes if there are any uh, extra questions or discussion. Mm -hmm.